I'm originally from Holland, <laughs> and uh, I've been living in Japan for more than 25 years. I don't count years anymore. Uh, otherwise, you can figure out how old I am. And <laughs> but uh, as, as Larry was saying, I've been spending most of my, my life in financial technology, but I've been doing a few things uh, uh, over the years. Uh, currently, I'm an affiliate researcher with MIT, where I partly focus on the Safe Cost project, partly on blockchain-related research, and at KU University, uh, similarly, I do research in those two areas. And uh, before I go and talk about the Safecast story, a little bit my personal story, why did I start Safecast uh, together with uh, two other gentlemen, which you will see in the video I'm going to play. Uh, I was in Tokyo uh, when the disaster happened. Uh, I'll never forget that. Uh, the worst earthquake definitely I experienced in my life. And we were only in Tokyo, you know, very far away from the, from the center. My wife's family so happens to be from a city called Ishinomaki, which was in the center of the earthquake. Uh, the worst hit city in terms of the tsunami. And uh, the moment it happened, I saw it live on television. Uh, I literally got married there. Uh, it's very dear to my heart, that city. And of course, all my, my family-in-law lives, uh, uh, lives there. So when it happened, the first reaction was, what can we do to go and help them? But within 24 hours, that turned into, you know, what is this Fukushima in the middle? And Fukushima is literally in the middle between Tokyo and Ishinomaki. So this invisible wall of radiation became the main obstacle, and that became my focus on the second day. What do we do about that? Because uh, my daughter at that time was about six, seven years old, and suddenly, as a parent, what do we do? So, and that, that drove the thing, you know, don't panic. Don't do things that don't make sense, because my whole livelihood is built in Japan. My family is there. Uh, I'm not going to leave, but I want to know what's happening. And that lack of information became the action I took uh, as a result of the earthquake. So what I want to do is I want to play a very short video for three minutes. It will tell you this, this, the original story of Safecast, how we started. And uh, uh, then I want to go a little bit uh, in the story behind it. Uh, so the three of us are just talking, where can we find information? Oh, we can't find radiation data anywhere. And it's not because it's not being published, it's because it doesn't exist. Nobody was paying attention to this stuff. And so that's when we decided that we could start pooling our resources to get equipment, get equipment in people's hands and go collect some of this data and publish it so that there would at least be something available. Within a week, we had 20, 25 people all in this Skype chat room brainstorming and trying to figure out a solution to this problem. We're looking online and we couldn't get any Geiger counters. Literally within 24 hours, the whole world supply was uh, sold out. When we realized that we couldn't get the equipment, we decided that the only way to get this done is let's go and build it ourselves. So we came up with the idea that if we put a Geiger counter on a car and we drive around with it, we can collect radiation and put it on the map. Only problem was is we didn't have the equipment, we didn't have the system. So solution was go to Tokyo Hackerspace where there was lots of people that knew how to put things together. And on the sixth day after we had the idea, we had a working system. The next day we were off to Fukushima doing our first measurements. As we started taking measurements, we saw that a reading can change like 100% just by crossing a street. And that's when we realized that it was really important for us to take very granular street by street readings every five seconds and publish really granular data so that people can drill all the way down and see exactly what the reading is right in front of their house, not an average of the entire city. After a couple of months, we realized that it would be much better for volunteers to have something that would be very concise and compact. As we redeveloped the whole system and we were able to use Arduinos and open hardware to fit it into a bento box. And that's how we came up with the bento Geiger system. Once we built one, we taught other people to build many more of them. And that really allowed us to scale up dramatically. Well, this is a disaster. This is a tremendous opportunity to take this tons of data that's being collected and try to understand what the effects on people is. That can only happen if we share the data and we put the medical data together with the radiation data. And right now the key to combining data is to make it open. And so one of the really important features of the SafeCast project is we're using a CC0 public domain dedication for all of the data so that we can try to get people to do data science on it. We found out from Fukushima that the experts really weren't very helpful. And in fact, that citizen science actually works. We were able to collect more data than all the projects in history, and a lot of scientists came together. And by pulling through the network, we were able to become the best in the world. So I think what SafeCast proves is that all the preparation in the world, all the money in the world, still fails. 
if you don't have a rapid, agile, resilient system. Because of the internet, because of our agility, because of our openness, within weeks, we had the world's experts together to do this. And within a year, we're the biggest project that has ever existed in this kind of monitoring. And I think it really shows that with the right people and the right resources and agility, you can beat the pants off of any government pre-planning or institutional system. So I want to go back in time a little bit to 2011 in Fukushima. And I want to talk about what data was there at the beginning of the accident. And this is very important to see. And I'm going to show you a few other things throughout my talk. And it will be very good to see the context and also compare. Uh, and hopefully you will uh, see that what, is, what happened there is not so unique to, to Japan or to Fukushima. So this was the data that the Japanese government published in the first few days after the accident. Looks like there's lots of data, but this, this map scale is about 200, 300 kilometers by 200 kilometers. And they had maybe about 20 measurements. And actually, this was one person driving around and stopping at various locations. This was it. And, uh, you know, frankly speaking, I think you will have a hard time to figure out what this is because there were not even, they didn't even say what, what, kind, what, what these measurements meant. Not even, there was no unit with it. And, you know, good luck to you. So this is what we got initially uh, from the government. Then, uh, very shortly after the accident happened, in the first two, three days, the U.S. Uh, Navy or Army uh, was getting help from NNSSA uh, to map out the radiation levels around Daiichi. This was done by a helicopter. And uh, the helicopter uh, system was able to very quickly kind of give you a, a reasonable idea as to what really happened. And you can see here is, is that, important to notice is that the plume went this direction, actually went this way and it went down here. And uh, the Japanese government had said that this is the exclusion zone, only around here. And they kind of, had this, you know, they kind of pretended that this was kind of like, you know, distance based, it had nothing to do with distance. But this was measured by the uh, US authorities and given to the Japanese government almost immediately after that, the Japanese government never used this data, okay? Uh, then this is the data that we got out of our own system a week after we, you know, what, I, what I mentioned, we went to Fukushima. Here you can see this is about 5,000 measurements uh, taken in a couple of hours. And we're going to show you what happens if you do that randomly with lots of volunteers. So tremendous amount of granularity and detail, very, very different. Ultimately, the data that the U.S. government had given to the uh, Japanese authorities finally was published in the Japanese newspaper in this format. Okay, and this is what we saw on TV. This is what the rest of the population uh, was given. This is national TV on Japan, uh, April, about a month after the accident. Uh, if you don't know Japan, every, this is a prefecture. There's millions of people. Each prefecture, this is Tokyo, each prefecture got one measurement. And for good measure, this is actually Fukushima here. Uh, there is a label in front of it. So this is what we got a month after the accident, okay? So nothing to worry about because this is basically very low. The reality was it was, you know, I can tell you in this location here, we measured about 10 times more around this area here when we went there ourselves. So this is reality. This is what came out of, uh, of that. So I want to forward a little bit to Washington, D.C., 2014. In 2014, we did a workshop, uh, uh, you know, three years later. And I'm going to pass around, maybe, Ed, if you pass around on this side. This is what we currently do at our volunteers. So you saw in the, in the, in the, in the video, you saw us put kind of a, a bigger box on the, uh, on, on the car. Today we have miniaturized that, and it actually is something you can order on Amazon. You have to build it yourself, but it is basically something that our volunteers are using. So we did a workshop in Washington, D.C. in 2014, and uh, this is me and my co-founder in Washington, D.C. in 2014, and this is where we were kind of plotting out where we're going to measure with the group, and this is uh, the group, we had about 25 people uh, together. Uh, this was organized with the help of NRDC. We had people from all kinds of people around the table. This is really interesting. Uh, this is pre-polarization, I would say. We had people from Greenpeace and we had people from the nuclear industry. Everybody was sitting together uh, trying to figure out how to measure radiation in Washington, D.C. Uh, this is the entire group. We also had the people that were, the people in the helicopter from NSSA, they participated in this workshop as well. And this is an important detail. So this is us on the roof. And uh, this is the group. Uh, after they built the equipment, everybody carried their atomic clocks around uh, Washington, D.C. 
And uh, so this was the day before uh, the group measured. As you can see on this map, there's no measurements at all uh, on our map. And here's just the time slider uh, on our map system, and we're moving the time slider forward by a day. And this is what the group measured in one day. Literally, actually not one day, probably half a day of walking around. And you can see that lots of people kind of traverse the same area. Some people are a bit more adventurous. Uh, you can see here around the National Monument, you see there's a hotspot here. It's a slightly elevated radiation, about two, two to three times background. The reason for this is very simple. This monument is made of solid granite. Granite is by naturally radioactive, and the U.S. is, you know, in the U.S. there's lots of granite in, in the soil, and uh, this thing shows up, okay? Now, what was interesting, as I mentioned, the NSA was participating as well, and we published this immediately. This, you know, obviously, we published this public, and the NSA said, well, you know, uh, we also have data, and we will check if, you know, we can compare it with your data. But once they saw it, they said, wait a minute, you know, we look like a bit, little bit of, you know, why, did, why don't we publish this data? Uh, now, Safecast has published it, so sure that they published their measurements of Washington, D.C. a couple of weeks later publicly as well. And this is how that looks like. And if you look very carefully, you see here is the same yellow hotspot here corresponds with the light blue on our map. Interestingly, you know, and we don't know why, this area here is kind of uh, classified, all right? But, you know, that doesn't matter if you walk around, you can still measure it, right? Okay, so that's not to the point. To the point is here is, is that we were able to measure Washington, D.C., but we also have, were able to create a small impact by actually, you know, citizen action. We can actually help governments be a little bit more transparent. Okay, so before I do that, I need to definitely... I just came yesterday, and this is the, the worst time of today for my jet lag, so my apologies. Um, so where we are today, and I want to specifically talk about the United States because that's where, I'm, where we are today. And uh, as you know, a couple of months ago, uh, there were uh, worries that the, the U.S. government would cut funding to some of NASA's Earth Science programs, specifically uh, programs that basically measure uh, various parameters that tie to climate changes, etc., uh, then uh, your president uh, promised that he would not turn off the EPA's data servers. Uh, uh, it was, I think, in March or something. So we said, oh, yeah, thankfully. But because of that, lots of people started to uh, download all the data that the EPA had collected and try to preserve it. And sure about April 28th, uh, you no, know, we're still going to remove it, and the data is gone. Okay. So this is very interesting because uh, this is just data. Okay. And uh, now I want to so I want to move on to today, where we are now. And I don't want to scare you or anything like this, but um, there's some interesting things happening. And uh, as you know, there's a big hurricane coming. And uh, this is our tweet, uh, which we tweeted this morning. Uh, basically, we're talking about Turkey Point, which is the nuclear power plant south of Miami. And uh, we want to keep a close eye on that because if there's flooding, etc., uh, you know, th some things may happen and may not be good. Uh, so, and this is literally this morning, the Miami, Miami Herald had an article, uh, you know, uh, are the South Florida nuclear power plants safe? And, uh, you know, uh, you can look it up, but they interviewed the, the plant manager, and he said, well, we, when Andrew passed by, we had lots of things that broke, but, you know, at the end of the day, there was no disaster, only $100 million of damage. And he said it handled Andrew as was designed to, okay? It was one of the safest and most robust structures in the state, if not the country. So a very, very term, determined statement. However, he talks about that, you know, that they have generators and they have backup generators and we're all good. Now, I can tell you that is exactly what the officials in Japan have been telling us up to Fukushima Daiichi happened. Exactly the same statement. We have generators, we have backups. We're ready for this. Don't worry about it. So most likely it will be fine. Uh, I'm not trying to speculate. But, you know, these are the context for what, what can happen tomorrow. Um, actually, as of this, more, uh, this afternoon, I saw a news flash that they are going to shut down the power plants in, in anticipation of, of the hurricane. And uh, most people think that we're safe, but uh, even, if, you know, even if you shut down the plant, you still have to cool it. You still need power to do that. And so this is the effect of uh, uh, Harvey. Uh, and uh, Harvey, the flooding caused lots of, uh, there were some chemical waste dumps. And there was also a nuclear waste dam that could flood it out. And so now lots of that stuff is basically mixing into the, into the flood water. And this, is, uh, this gentleman is a spokesman for the Houston Health Department. His statement is there's no need to test it. It's contaminated. There's millions of contaminants. 
So no need to measure it. You know, we already know what's in there. Don't worry, right? So this is kind of the, the context that is not, un not unique to the US. It's not unique to Japan. We see this all over the world where basically we citizens, don't worry, the experts will take care of it until it goes wrong. So the key thing is, <laughs> the key thing is, is trust no one. Okay, so now what do we do? And now we're, you know, and this is, an, this is it, you know, it's very interesting, you know, if, you would, if I would have done this talk uh, a year ago, I would not even have dreamt that I would have this statement, but we now have reached the, the age of fake news, and it is uh, increasingly becoming an issue for uh, us citizens to figure out, you know, what is really happening, what should we think, what should we do, and what action should we take, because we really don't know what's real and not real anymore. So I'm going to focus on environmental data. Safecast is started with radiation, but we defined our, our mission and goal to focus on public, open, trustworthy environmental data. So we're talking about what's in the air, what's in the water, what, what about radiation? That's all we're trying to do. How simple it may seem, how complex it is. So now, the problem is, is that you know, in, in, in Japan, we couldn't really trust the government. And even today, if you go to Fukushima, people will not trust what the government is saying, even though we know that most of the data they publish is very much what we see today as well. And the same thing is happening in the US, and you'll find many countries where people have lost trust in their governments, or there are governments that simply don't have data, so you don't have to worry about it, you know, nothing to trust in. So, so once we get that dilemma that once we citizens lose trust in a central organization, then whatever the central organization has done loses its value. And then we become worried because we don't have, if you're in the car and you switch off the dashboard, you can imagine what will happen. So that's kind of what is happening. So now how do we, how would we try to solve that, that problem in safe cost is by actually taking citizens ourselves and we all, you know, I just passed around our, our measurement system. So let's imagine, you know, that we have never met each other and I don't think I've met most of you. And uh, because I've never met you, I don't have any basis to trust you. Basically, there's no trust in this room. Even though we're nice to each other, we, we don't trust each other yet. We don't know each other, right? So there's nothing wrong with that. That is, you know, that's just a fact. And, but because we don't know each other and we all take a device like this and I'll ask you to walk around the campus here and we all come back and we compare the data and we put the data on a map and we basically kind of see that the data is lining up, then we will say, well, you know, I kind of trust that because all these independent people came to the same, uh, same kind of conclusion. And uh, we also make sure that the design of the Geiger counter, everything is published openly as well so everybody can examine that yeah, that device is, is a credible device. So what we're doing is, is basically by having random people that don't know each other walk around, we can create data that we can trust. So that is kind of an interesting dilemma, right? So because there is no trust, we have an opportunity to create trust. So, and that's really what we do. So this is just an example of people walking around in the same area with the system that you had in your hands. And you see all these kind of concentration of dots around the road. This basically confirms this, you know, the, 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 the trustworthiness of the, of the measurements. So in our, in safe costs, we don't tell people where to measure. We allow people to measure wherever they want. And specifically, that means that they will measure the same areas randomly. And that's perfectly, perfectly works for what we want to do. So the next thing we can do is, is we then can take this, this data that we have collected and we can compare it with what governments or official institutions are collecting and we can start putting checks and balances in place. And this is really kind of the overall thought behind safeguards is, is to start building that infrastructure. Also realize that these people here will measure what they care about. The government here will measure wherever they can put a station up. And you know, it's very interesting in many cases that is on a very clean hill with lots of trees around it and stuff like that or in the park because there's space there. I'm trying to be nice. But uh, in Fukushima, they put measurement poles down after they clean the area. Of course, it gives very good measurements. But the, the whole idea is, is that we can start building checks and balances, but also when we measure, we kind of want to measure our own street, our own, you know, the school where our kids are going, the place where we go shopping or the place we work. So we also get more focused data that we actually care about. So this is really kind of the safe cost philosophy in terms of how the measurement works. Uh, I want to uh, spend a, a few moments 
uh, looking at some of the measurements. And today, uh, special guest uh, uh, Ed is here. And maybe Ed is nice if you introduce yourself very quickly. Ed is one of our volunteers who he measures here. He built a device. Uh, he's from here. And I asked him if, if he could spend a few, uh, you know, few moments going around our map. And uh, absolutely help you with that. So the uh, floor is yours. And then actually, just before that, let me very quickly before we switch. This is your university, Stanford University. Here, this is me walking around just before I came here, measuring around, okay? So, and we're going to look at Stanford area on the map in a moment, and you can see there is much more data than what I collected. But this gives you an idea how it, how it works. And the dark blue means basically the cosmic background radiation, primarily no, unfortunately, no monuments that glow up in the dark and stuff like that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Can everyone hear me? Oh, yes. Good afternoon. So I'm Ed Lafargue, live in Palo Alto, actually. And um, I've been a SafeCast volunteer for um, a couple of years. Um, started to get involved um, after SafeCast did a Kickstarter for an open source Geiger counter. Peter has mentioned it a couple of times. So everything is open in the infrastructure from the devices all the way to the data. And so one thing leading to another, I built a big IG and continued uh, contributing. And this is really the, the end result for most people. Does this, is it necessary or? Okay, okay. So this is the SafeCast. I think you guys okay. are recording, right? Okay, okay yeah. very good. So this is the SafeCast uh, map. How many data points do we have today? Uh, over 75 million. Okay. Locations measured. So everything uh, volunteers create, um, gather on their big IDs on their devices is saved and uploaded to the to the map. So as you can see here, this is Japan. And we have so many points in Japan that we are able to extrapolate to have a background map. But as you can see here, so this is the Fukushima Daiichi uh, zone. So in green, this is the what we call the so extrusion zone. Just, just you know, this may look like an abstract painting for some of you, but for me this is, you know, I know exactly where what is, but uh, all these kind of doodling things here, they're also all roads. So we measure on the roads. And literally, if you look very carefully, you don't see any road that is not being traversed. So this is basically the whole network of nodes. And where you see the concentrations, obviously, where the cities are. And the area where you don't see concentrations is where the mountains are. So, okay. um, yeah. And you can see the power plant that melted down is here. So you can really see the plume yeah. afterwards. One thing that you can see as well is uh, those little uh, dots here, and these are actually fixed monitoring stations. So SafeCast has a network of uh, mobile stations and fixed monitoring stations, which are really great to see long-term trends. Um, these stream their data in real time. If we look at this uh, link, like more info, we should see. So this one was actually installed what, two years ago. I was with the um, with the team in uh, in Japan when we installed it. Ed. Somewhere in the somewhere in the picture, Ed. Ed and these Ed. are those uh, fixed stations. So they are connected all the time and everything is archived. So well, this is just, yeah. just a very little tidbit, you know, we went on a boat and we went as close as we could get to the plant without getting arrested. And, um, you know, the, the so you inside the plant, we have measured inside the plant as well. The levels here are, are extremely high. You know, they're, they're, today it's about 80% less than what it was six years ago. But when we measured the first time, it was about 500 microsieverts here. But on the boat, it's nothing. It's kind of interesting, and the reason for it is very simple. The, the water is polluted, but water is a super, super good uh, shield for radiation. And so if you're, when you're on the boat, you basically only get cosmic radiation. So yes. counterintuitive, but it's scientifically very easy to understand. Mm -hmm. But we wanted to do that because we wanted to confirm that the air was kind of, there were no air particles floating around here, and we couldn't see, measure any of that. So this, this is was, of course, very different site. at the accident time. There was fallout all over the place. Lots of it, actually, 80% of the fallout went into the ocean. Uh, only 20% uh, was uh, on the land. If the wind would have been in the opposite direction, you can speculate that uh, the disaster would have been significantly worse. And so this is Japan. But what's interesting with um, SafeCast, those 175 million data points are actually uh, created by volunteers all over the world. We have about, what, 1,000 big IGs, roughly? No, no, it's more now. 1,500 now. 1,500 now, so yeah. it's growing all the time. Yeah. And so we have people literally all over the place. As you can see, some people have done these um, surveys here, so you can see these little... This is the beginning at all. Yep. This is the Rennet Dome, if you're familiar with that. 
uh, and then almost we have, nothing measurable anymore. And then we have the US, uh, quite a few data points. And as uh, Peter mentioned earlier, with the um, uh, the National Mall, so some parts of the US have a higher elevation than granite. And so you can see Colorado, for instance. You can see closer to us uh, the Tahoe area, Yosemite with Sierra, higher altitude as well. Here you can see Palo Alto. We have one local station that's actually at my house. Um, we have uh, one uh, sea station in Bodega Bay at the UC Davis uh, Marine Lab. This one is off, and we are hoping to restore it this weekend. So this one measures uh, radiation levels in water. And so all these are really volunteers. I've driven quite a few of these roads, not all of them by far. Uh, and we can see as well, probably got it from my accent. There's a couple of things that I did in France. Um, one interesting tidbit here, uh, if we zoom in, you can see this region in France is um, a lot more radioactive than usual background. And if we uh, go uh, deeper here, where is it? around here, we should be seeing a couple of hotspots. And so this is something that um, Peter mentioned earlier. So there are quite a few uh, waste sites around the world. And you don't need to go to Chernobyl or to the Fukushima Daiichi plant to see uh, that there are radioactive hotspots pretty much all over the place. Ever since we discovered how to enrich uranium, we've been storing uh, nuclear waste pretty much all over the place. So this is actually an old an, an uranium mine. It's one of uh, 250 sites in France. There's about 1,700 similar sites in the US. And all of these are actually cordoned off and fairly contaminated. Uh, so again, so this is an interesting, um, it's quite interesting to go around because we publish this. We help local um, organizations as well who have been fighting to get authorities to decontaminate those sites. You, it's very difficult to get uh, objective data. And so just uploading and sharing this data on those various sites uh, helps a little bit all these local organizations to, um, to really advance their case. And here, for instance, we are hoping that this site will get decontaminated at some point in the next couple of years. But it's been more than a 20 year, uh, 20 year fight. And so one last uh, bit, and Peter, let me know if there are other things you, nope, you like to see, but the Czech Republic is in a really interesting place. We've had tremendous traction in the Czech Republic with, as you can see, lots of volunteers who have really across the whole country and created really, really measured, uh, um, detailed measurements. I know, Peter, if you want to... No, oh, I think it's good. I, I just want to more. mention, you know, the, the map is filling in randomly. So as, as Ed was saying is, is that there's lots of activity here. But in other parts of Europe you know, or anywhere where we measure, there's people that literally every day measure a small part of the city. We have some guy in Holland, every day he measures a small part of his city. There's somebody in, in Norway that has covered his entire city on bicycle and it takes months, but these volunteers just go at it. And every volunteer has his own little strategy to measure whatever they want to measure. And that randomness is how the map is filled in. It's really based on people's own initiative or interest. And the interest is different for different people. Different drivers are there for people to go out and measure. This is somebody who just took the tour around Iceland, right? So, you know, this person was the first one to measure our country in a day. But, uh, <laughs> But it is possible, you know, there is still lots of opportunity in, uh, in Latin America if you want to be the first in the country. And to your point, um, Iceland, so we had one volunteer do the whole country once, and then actually people go to Iceland every once in a while, and so we've had many more volunteers occasionally uh, driving the same roads. There are not that many uh, roads around the country in Iceland, and so every new person who drives just adds to the trust of the, of the measurements. What is interesting, most people think that volcanoes are radioactive, and actually it's, uh, it is a mixed bag. In this case, you know, Iceland is lots of volcanoes, not much of that. If you go to Italy, it's, uh, it, there's lots of radioactivity. So, Have any tourists to Chernobyl been Oh, yes, yes, uh, Chernobyl, uh, quite uh, a few Ukraine. people have been there with our devices. Uh, and uh, some of you may know, but it is kind of a tourist attraction right now. You have to pay a couple hundred dollars to go in. Uh, it's pretty much restricted as to where you can go. And uh, so this is the plant itself. 
And this is 35 years after the accident. And if you look at the, the cholera scheme, it still very much matches what is in Fukushima. Yes. And, you know, sadly speaking, there's only a few locations in the world I know of that are this high. That's Fukushima. It's uh, uh, Chernobyl. Chernobyl and it is Hanford here in the U.S. Yes. Okay. Yeah, Hanford is actually the, one of the most contaminated Well, you know, we can't say too much, world, you know, right? yeah, whatever data we have seen is not, doesn't look very good. And uh, so. So here you are. Yes, thank you very much, Ed. So I want to. Let me take over from here. Uh, so what I, so why we're sh I'm showing you this, this gives you an idea of what we really do. This is the measurements we take. And lots of these measurements have stories and, and things around it. And we publish that uh, on, our, uh, on our website as well. And um, let me see. OK, here we are. Uh, so uh, so as, as Ed was mentioning, so we have published all this data. We have 75 million measurements uh, in our database, 100% uh, public domain. So if you collect for safe costs, all your data will be published. Uh, because it is public domain, uh, lots of people are using it. Uh, it's the largest data set uh, literally in, a, in, in, this, in this space that exists. Thousands of devices, thousands of volunteers are participating. Uh, we don't have a single source, no closed data, no, you know, no fizziness about what's being used, how it's being measured. Everything is full disclosed. Uh, we have many projects that we run as a volunteer organization. Uh, we are a volunteer organization. We're not a company. We're a nonprofit, technically speaking. But... Uh, most of the, uh, the activities are, we have projects where we build things, where we figure out things, we visualize and things like that. And we have people that measure in the field. Uh, everything is, we use various open, open standard frameworks. So what I want to do is, is uh, if you've kind of seen what we kind of have been doing, and what I thought was be interesting is, is to kind of share with you a little bit about, you know, what, what is, how, how do we think and how, made, how, how was this made possible? So what are kind of the principles behind uh, the Safe Cost project? And I think it's interesting, even if you're not interested in radiation measurement or environment or whatever, uh, if you're interested in, in doing a startup or if you're interested in, in how, how do you run crowdsourcing type of projects, I think there is some, uh, some interesting insights I, I would love to share with you. And in order to share this with you, I'm going to use the analogy of set what, what is called in, in, in Japan, not the seven samurai, but the seven lucky gods. In Japan, there is, you know, they're kind of lucky charms, and there are seven of them, and lots of people have these at their houses. Each lucky god uh, symbolizes a specific aspect of life, like longevity or fertility or harvest or something like that. So I'm going to use these seven principles. And before I go in there, I want to kind of step back and say, you know, what, what, is, what is safe cost and what are we trying to do here? And really, this, as I mentioned, you know, the reason I started is, is can we trust the data? You know, what does this data mean, right? The, the slide I showed you where the you know, Japanese government, just numbers, no, no, no idea what it means. Uh, and how, do I can, how can I access my own data? How do I make sure that the, it's not a one-way thing? You know, how can I get access to stuff? I think these are very fundamental uh, questions. How fundamental they may seem, in many cases, uh, this is why we have the problem. So and I want to give you an example of some other project that uh, looks very similar to our safe cost project, but uh, it's just an example, but I want to show you what, what can go wrong if you try to do a crowdsourcing project. Uh, I'm not sure if some of you remember, but about a uh, sim similar time frame, about five, six years ago, there was a Kickstarter campaign, uh, and the Kickstarter campaign was called Air Quality Egg. I'm not sure if any of you have heard about the project. No, okay. Air Quality Egg was a uh, IoT project, and the idea was that you would get a little air quality monitor which you could put at home, and it would uh, allow you to upload the data to a central database, share it with the community, uh, and improve the world uh, as a result. And uh, this was a relatively successful uh, Kickstarter campaign. Lots of people uh, uh, bought the device, and uh, what happened was that lots of people put the device at home, and then what's, what, what, uh, what happened is, is that Instead of getting any insight or whatever, you got this map. And this map, all it was telling you is how many they had sold and where. <laughs> okay? <laughs> all right, so this is not very useful. It doesn't tell me, you know, no, no, nothing in here. So this was great for the sales and marketing department of Air Quality Act, but not really what we as citizens were looking forward to. So important thing here is, is that uh, this was basically a marketing and sales campaign masquerading as citizen science. And, uh, uh, you know, the... The driver was the device and the sales of the device, not you know, trying to create a useful set of data that can, can help us. Okay. Uh, it got even worse with the project. You know, so the data that was collected by the devices were, was uploaded to a service by the name of 
Patch Bay. I always call it Patube, I don't know why. But it was a company called Patch Bay, and uh, that was kind of the first kind of online IoT database. You could connect your little Arduino to the cloud, and Patch Bay would show you the data. It was really cute, and lots of people used that service. It was bought out by a company called uh, LogMeIn, and then that company was taken over or renamed itself, or no, they renamed it to Civilly. I have no idea why. But, uh, and then what happened is, is then they said, okay, all your data that you've been uploading, if you want to see it, we're going to charge you monthly for that. Well, guess what? You know, that was not really what people expected when they got into the project, okay? Um, so what happened is, is this project kind of damaged the whole, you know, reputation of citizen science and also affected us to some extent. Lots of people say, oh, you're not the other air quality act. And what, what about it? So, uh, so you know, what, what in essence what happens here is, is that, and this is not the only example, there are a lot of projects that are following a similar pattern. The pattern is, is exciting device, new technology, lots of devices out, and then what happens next is the thing get bricked, and then I call this the internet of nothing. So all you get is a wonderful device, and a year later, it will not connect to anything, and some of these devices get bricked. Uh, for example, Google Glass or you know, some other Google project, I forgot the name of it, where uh, they took over company. Lots of people had the device at home. Google decided to cancel it. All you have is basically a piece of electronics that doesn't do anything anymore. So this is something that uh, is not the Internet of Things. This is the Internet of Nothing. So how do you sustain that? It's really, really the, the, the challenge in this. And I can tell you it's challenging. Uh, there's one more recent example. You know, you can take a brick and you can squash juice with it, right? You can squash um, you know, uh, fruits with it and get juice, but you can also get a fancy break like this, right? <laughs> so, so it is not something that happened five years ago. It is very pervasive, and I, you know, I think most of you know the story behind this company, uh, how much, over 100 millions of dollars of venture capital and basically building a fancy break. So, uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the so-called principles that we use in the project, and it's kind of an evolving thing. We have discovered these as we make mistakes and stumbled around we came to know what are the things that keep us going, and what works and what doesn't work. And if you're really interested in some of these principles, they're not really uh, you know, unique our invention. Some of these uh, are uh, coming from uh, our co-founder, Joe Ito. He wrote a book uh, end of last year called Whiplash, in which he describes nine principles that he sees as the guiding principles for surviving the future, specifically him looking from the MIT Media Lab. He thinks these are kind of the, the ways of thinking. Safecast is mentioned in the book. If you're really interested in this, I highly recommend the book. It's a really good insight into you know, mechanisms and thinking uh, that kind of are counterintuitive but are very, very useful if you want to survive the future. Uh, so the first principle is the principle of pro data. Uh, you can imagine that anything nuclear is polarized. You have people that are anti-nuclear, you have people that are pro-nuclear, and that's about it. And so when we started this, Lots of people were confused because they said, Peter, are you pro-nuclear? Or Peter, are you anti-nuclear? I said, no, I'm pro-data. What? No, cannot. You have to be pro-nuclear. So the pro-nuclear people thought that we were anti-nuclear, and the anti-nuclear people thought we were pro-nuclear. This is kind of how it went. Uh, over, the, over the years, people have came to understand that we are uh, none of that. But it is extremely hard not to get pushed into a corner, whatever you do. Same thing if you measure temperature. Oh, are you anti-climate, pro-climate? So, so it, it is, in other words, it is really difficult to be Pro data. I can tell you, uh, it's it's a very simple thing, but it's very hard to stay objectively trying to focus on what's happening. And um, but if we don't have data, if we don't focus on data, we will make the wrong decisions. And that is the whole problem with you know when we talk about fake news, what I mentioned earlier, is that is really a threat. You know, if we don't have the right data, you know, we as a society may be uh, going off the cliffs. Uh, data also removes bias, and I think that's good. You know, we have too much bias. You know, let's go back to what really is happening. Even if the data is telling us something that we didn't expect or didn't believe in, you know, what is more important? Is it the data or our false belief? So this is principle number one, and we always stick to this. In our organization, we have lots of volunteers, and I tell you, we have lots of different voices about nuclear power or uh, climate change and everything in our organization. And it is not our focus or goal. And because we have pro-data focus, everybody agrees that that is the connector. This is a way to connect. Uh, always open. Uh, Creative Commons Zero, I don't have to explain this, I think, in this room. I think oh, most of you will know what this is. Uh, so we basically make everything public domain in terms of the data we publish. And that's really important. We have uh, now very, uh, lots of researchers are using our data. And why is that great? It's because our data is public domain. They don't have to worry about 
uh, not having, you know, worry about publishing with our data because fully public domain, no need to, uh, you know, uh, worry about copyrights or any lawsuits or anything like that. Go and use it. And what is exciting is, is that we have quite a few uh, researchers, uh, PhD students, uh, undergrad students that have written theses and papers using our data for all kinds of different purposes. And that's super exciting. Uh, and one of the reasons now is, is because the data set is so big is that we now have people that use it because they want to do big data. And there's not, there's not a lot of big data sets that have GPS that is collected by individuals, for example. So, deploy or die. This is something that Joey uh, talks about. If you know a little bit about Joey Ito, you know a little bit about MIT Media Lab. Uh, 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 Negro Ponte uh, started, you know, uh, de demo or die was kind of his mantra. Joey said, deploy or die. And the idea behind this, if you don't put it in society, you don't interact, you you're basically don't know if it will work within the context. Even if you can make a prototype, it doesn't mean anything the moment it goes out of the room. So the whole idea is, is and this is what we need safeguards is, you know, deploy immediately, try out, see what works, doesn't work, go back and try again, try again. And sometimes we do deploy and die, you know, happens. Then we go back and we have a whole collection of devices in our office that are failures. And we talk about it because those are the learning opportunities and we know what doesn't work. Uh, it's not the Air Quality Act, uh, it's, it's also safe cause, you know, you go through this, but we correct very quickly. And I think that's very important. So if you focus on innovation, Joito has a famous thing he said, you know, to innovate you need to reduce the cost of failure. And it's very profound because if you think about it, it makes lots of sense. I spent most of my life in Japan, uh, which is, a, and the rest, you know, in Asia it's, it's, it's seen as a big thing if you fail but it's actually a very smart thing to fail smartly. You don't fail stupidly, but failing smartly is very good. Um, the other principle uh, we have is do it yourself. Not only do our volunteers measure themselves, we all, they also build their own devices. And it was kind of born out of necessity. We had no money, so we couldn't really go to a factory and order thousands of these devices because we still have the money to do it. So we, out of the, you know, the necessity came a good idea. I said, well, if we can build it as volunteer group, why don't we just have everybody build their own? So we made the device into a kit. We made sure that it has a very good manual. And we took a chance and we started to do workshops. And uh, interestingly enough, lots of people were able to build the device with a little bit of help. And we made the manual better and we put it on Amazon. So now most of our volunteers buy it on Amazon with the manual and they're able to build this device on their own. What is interesting is, is that in the beginning, we experimented with giving the devices away for free. We thought it's good, you know, why, you know, this is... Uh, this is you know, the right thing to do. But what we find out is, is that free stuff doesn't translate to great volunteers. Okay? If I tell you this is free, you will say, yeah, I'll take it home, you know, whatever. Yeah, there's no commitment in that. So we, the interesting thing we find out is, is that if we have people that actually spend some money on the devices, around five, six hundred dollars, and spend the day building it, they will go out and measure a lot of data because you're not going to spend that money just to have some gadget uh, to show your friends, right? It's a little bit expensive. So we find out that you know, commitment also translates into you know, what, how do you filter out the people that are really going to measure. And we don't need every citizen to measure. We need a few people per city can do most of the work. So it's, it's not that you know, we have to have it cheap so that everybody can have one. Would be great, I admit. But technically, today with the cost of the census, et cetera, it's unfortunately not possible. So do it yourself is a very important god for us. You know? Get involved, do it yourself. You know? and it's also important because if you don't care about your environment, then don't care about it. You know, if you're not willing to invest a little bit of energy to say what is happening around me, you should not worry about it. Same thing, if you have a fever, it's up to you to take the measurement and go to the doctor, right? If you say, well, you know, whatever, then you have to deal with the consequences of that. And this is the same idea here. So this is your thermometer. You're building your own thermometer. Um, another very important uh, god is the god of antidisciplinary. And uh, depending on what cultural background you have, uh, I think in the U.S., uh, interdisciplinary uh, type of working is much more common. In other cultures, the silo thinking is still very, very strong. So uh, if, for example, the device you were having, if we would have a group of engineers build this, it probably would have been a more accurate device, but it would be much bigger, and it would definitely not be portable. If we would have a bunch of scientists do it, it would have probably been super accurate, but definitely completely not handleable or not manufacturable. If we would have a group of artists do it, it would have looked exciting, but probably wouldn't even measure anything. So, <laughs> but if you put all these people together and you allow them a little bit to walk around, you get actually something like this. So, you know, the idea to make the device transparent, the idea that it actually is multiple colors, so it matches the, the, you know, you can match it with your own color or your 
color of your car or whatever you want to do with it. It comes in different colors. Um, it, it creates and it's something that is, uh, that is interesting. We also made it very rugged. Uh, most Geiger counters you can buy commercially, you can't drop them and definitely you can't drop them in the water. This thing you can go diving with, you can, uh, it, it survives tremendous amount of vibration and stuff like that. Uh, this thing in the background here is an artist in Hong Kong, uh, Chris Chung. And I never met him until um, uh, two months ago. But he made an artwork with our data. And you can, you know, if you go to this website, you can see the artwork. It is a video installation where he uses the data to create a virtual landscape of Hong Kong and Fukushima based on the measurements he did there. And it is kind of a virtual ride. Uh, it's a little bit scary because, you know, it's got, you, it uses, you drive into Fukushima and he, he simulates that the, the height of the buildings is the height of radiation. But this is another great example of how you can do things that you can never imagine, but it creates you know, a very interesting way of visualization that came out of it. And I met him uh, literally a couple of months ago, and uh, extremely amazing artist, uh, and he showed me lots of other things. And this is some of the excitement you get, which you never ever get in a normal project that you can do. And don't know where this will lead, but actually he got a prize for this in uh, Ars Electronica in Wien last year for this. So, pull over push. Pull over push. Uh, I already described that when we collect data, we don't decide who goes where. So sometimes people come to me and say, Peter, why should I measure? I said, whatever you want to measure, but don't ask me. So, but most people know where they want to measure, and that's why they're actually participating in the project. Um, and that creates a natural randomness and also creates basically the data where the data is needed most. So, and this pullover push is very important. So if you would push it out, you would be try to be efficient, only have one person measure one street, but then we don't have the validation. So we allow this to be random. But also pull off a push is when we do the project, when we need something, we pull it in when we need it. The internet is amazing for that. Uh, we've been doing this project, uh, most of the members we have are all over the world. Most of them we have never met physically each other, but they work virtually and we pull people in as we can. So this whole idea of pulling or just in time, delivering the Kanban system uh, that Toyota is famous for is a great principle uh, to build something out of nothing, literally. So it's, it's a very powerful concept. And it also means that it grows on its own instead of trying to push it. So the final god is the god of community. And this ties back to the story about the Air Quality Act. You know, so one thing we try to uh, focus on is, is not to become device-centric. Of course, the devices are important. We had to build them because they didn't exist. But the key thing is, is how do we tie that into the community? How do we make sure that the end goal is, you know, do we really build trust around data? Do we reach uh, you know, a point where we can talk to governments and start having a dialogue like we had NSA publishing data in Japan, we have dialogue, where, where we create impact. And the impact cannot be created with the device. The impact is created by everybody participating in the project. And uh, I'm going to give you a few quick examples of what we mean with community. And it touches all aspects of the community uh, that, we are, uh, that we're working on. Most, first of all, very simple, citizens themselves. You know, this is, uh, in Fukushima, this is, uh, these two people here are actual volunteers. This is their very cute little Suzuki car. And on here is the Geiger counter. And they were one of the first people that started to drive around with this device in May 2011. And they just drove around their whole city and they took it on themselves to measure it. And a very similar thing, you know, he, he was worried about his son, same age as my daughter. And he was just moved to, to the city Iwaki. And when he called me, he said, you know, should he move to Chiba Prefecture, which is near to Tokyo? <laughs> Turns out that the area that he was in had lower radiation than Chiba Prefecture, because Chiba actually got uh, a swat of Fukushima radiation. And you would have never known. He would actually have moved from lower to higher. So these are uh, the citizens. The next thing is children. We do a tremendous amount of educational efforts these days. Uh, we work with uh, high school kids, uh, primary school kids, lots of university students where we do uh, educational programs where we teach what we're actually teaching you right now. How does it, the project work? We, help, we work with them building Geiger counters. We send them out to go and measure and basically become a participant into this process. And then, you know, as they do that, they start to learn how, how as a citizen, they can participate. And we do lots of these. We just did uh, in last month, or did, yeah, last month we did six of these workshops with children in, uh, in uh, Japan and in, in Hong Kong and elsewhere. And this is something we feel is the most fundamental thing. We should teach our children about uh, how to measure your environment, do get involved in there. 
The other group of people we spend lots of time is the press. Uh, we have been covered by the press a lot, but we spend also a lot of time with the press educating them about Fukushima radiation environmental measurement. It works both ways. So it's good for us, we get an article, but we spend lots of time to actually get the errors out of the reporting, and we see that as an important way to basically get better quality news. And uh, uh, I don't blame the reporters. Nuclear science is awfully complex, and there's lots of things that are uh, sometimes taken out of context. Uh, I'm not sure if you remember, but a couple of years ago, there was a screaming newspaper article or an online article that there was super high radiation uh, detected on the California beaches. Uh, LA should be immediately evacuated, et cetera, et cetera. Turns out that the radiation was real, but it was nothing to do with Fukushima. That radiation was there for the last billion, couple of billions of years. It was the end of a river, and you know, we talked about uh, you know, natural stones and stuff. Over the millions of years, the end of the river had collected fine radioactive sand that came out of the mountains. It's been there forever. Uh, is natural, is still radiation, right? But uh, not a good reason to evacuate the city. So what we did is, is within 24 hours, we had our volunteers on the beach measuring, and we counter-published that right away. Then that got picked up by the same press again, and they said, safe cause debunks, blah, 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 story. <laughs> but, and we have been doing this a couple of times now. And, and it is really interesting to see uh, what the dynamics are, because you can counter-publish and get the facts right. In many cases, it doesn't happen. What gets published doesn't get corrected. And we, we think it is very important in the area that we have some expertise to make sure that the data is good. So that's what we do with the press. Um, companies, I'm not sure if you're from Japan, I think we have some people from Japan here. I think if you're from Japan, you know what this is, right? Not Kodawa I think you will know. This is the Japan Postal Bike. Uh, Japan Post, like in, in the US, is one of the largest uh, logistic organizations. They have 70,000 of these bikes driving around Japan every day, and they're one of our volunteers. Uh, they drive this around in a few cities in Fukushima. Uh, every year we remeasure with them. Uh, we're the only project ever in existence that had put something on the Japan postal bike. No other company has succeeded in that. So it's very special, and uh, uh, it's also a very interesting way to collaborate. And we have other companies that are regularly on the road, like taxi drivers, or companies that do uh, geo measurements, uh, not Google, but companies like Google, uh, that are also volunteering in the project and they drive our equipment around on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's a great way to collect lots of data. Uh, this is one of our uh, uh, core volunteers, uh, Asbi Brown. He is our lead scientist. Uh, and this is Asbi in Wien at the IEA conference behind closed doors sharing our story. And uh, I'm not going to go into details. There's a long story how we actually managed to get in there. But uh, uh, it set a process, uh, it started a process in the IEA to start thinking about citizen science more seriously. And now we're doing workshops together with the IEA where they bring in lots of people from lots of countries where we basically share what we're doing and people are building big IEAs and stuff like that. So this is another way to interact. Instead of saying the IEA is a closed organization and it's bad, and blah, 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 why not engage with it? Why don't you try to do something about it? And that's what we're trying to do. Uh, it's a long road, but I think we have made an, uh, a very good step in the right direction with them. This is a, uh, politicians. You know, this is a very loaded topic. We already spoke about politicians here. And you know, sometimes there's all kinds of politicians around the world. And this is a young politician in Taiwan. And when he was inaugurated, he was actually a safe cause volunteer. He took the, the equipment into the, into the diet room, and he spoke about this as an example of something he wanted to go and do in Taiwan. So good for him. Um, Finally, but not least, the scientific community. Uh, we are, call ourselves citizen science for the lack of a better word. Uh, and of course, there is science behind what we do. And sometimes we, you know, definitely in the beginning, the scientific community was very skeptical about safe costs. They said, well, you know, I'm a cheerist and these guys really don't know about radiation, eh, you know, whatever. And, you know, we didn't care about that because a good part of our, you know, part of our volunteers are actually scientists. So, you know, hey, come on, right? Uh, well, some of our volunteers are entirely not. It doesn't matter. But uh, we took it up ourselves and said, why don't we publish a paper about safe cost method? Because we make claims about it. And we did do that last year. Uh, we spent about a year uh, on the article, writing it, peer reviewing it, peer reviewing it, peer reviewing it. And finally, it got published. And it got published last year. And this is in a journal of radiological protection. I'm not sure if you heard about this journal. But this journal is a fairly established journal. It exists for more than 40 years. It's one of the journals to publish in. Uh, we published it, you can see it here, as of this morning, we had 5,000 downloads. Now, that may not be a lot for uh, you know, Taylor Swift, but for, 
before a scientific publication is a journal, the average is 200. Okay, all right. And this, so, and this, that, and this is in less, you know, just in a year. You can see that already cited by four articles, we were in the top 10 last year among, you know, very established, very famous scientists in the field. And this is citizen science as well. We're obviously a little bit proud about this. We're planning much more publications because of much more things we can publish. The idea of the publisher is to share, you know, just, you know, not to get gravy points and stuff like that. This is really, we think we can contribute back to the scientific community. And we got very, very good responses from this, uh, from this write-up. Um, other thing we do is, is basically we publish every year, uh, more on a continuous basis, a report, which we call the safe cost report, you know, logically. But this is basically 100, more than 100 pages now, uh, dump of all of the collective know-how we have in our group, because we have been doing this for a long time. We're not only measuring radiation, we also work with communities, we, uh, we work with other groups that do water or food, we work with on the health issues and stuff like that. Because we got so many questions through the internet of people asking so many questions, uh, difficult topics, we researched that and we started to answer them. We said, why don't we write it all down? And this has become a very um, useful handbook. If you want to study what happened in Fukushima, I can highly recommend it. It's fully researched, fully referenced. References the best research we think is available in the field. Uh, it also describes what we're doing in the project. So if you have some time, you can find it on our website. So let's talk about safe cars today. And uh, we started with radiation, but as I mentioned, our, our, when we created the name SafeCast, uh, it wasn't called RotCast or something like that. It was called SafeCast, and we wanted to focus on environmental data as the, glow, as the overall goal, but at the beginning we were busy with radiation. So, uh, Ed mentioned fixed sensors. We called them point cost. We have deployed them in various locations. Here's the same picture. This is in Fukushima where we work with communities, where we put sensors on their, on their in this case, a community center. People can see the radiation. This is what we have been doing for the last two years or so. And uh, we learned a lot from this. And one thing we learned is, is that drilling holes in people's houses is not something people like. So <laughs> this is one thing we learned. Second thing we learned is, is that in some areas, there's just simply no power available. And we also learned uh, uh, that you know, whatever little obstacle there is for people to do something, you know, people will just not do it. And this is human nature. You know? And for the same reason, if you put a battery in here, uh, the moment the battery runs out, it stops working. There are some other IoT projects that are great. The biggest problem is, is if you make something battery-based, forget it. It will just stop working. People just don't put new batteries in stuff. So we started to think through and said, you know, how can we make this better? Uh, these sensors do work very well, but they are hard to deploy. So we started to work on, and this is uh, you know, assembly at our office where we're getting ready for deployment. And we started a new project uh, last year called SolarCast. And as you, know, as you can guess, this is a solar-powered system. Uh, but also we decided to include air quality measurement as the next level. We have got so many people that have asked us, can we focus on air quality, specifically in Asia, uh, not just China, but all over Asia. There are significant issues with air quality, not only in, in Asia, in US, Europe, but the, the, the call is very big there. So we started to do a system. The system is designed by one of our core volunteers, uh, Ray Ozzy. Some of you may know his name. Uh, he uh, was very well known for Lotus Notes and other things. Uh, but he has been focusing on building something that is going to hope, hopefully help us to deploy faster. And the key driving principle is a new principle, drop and forget. So the whole idea is, is basically fully autonomous sensor, super low power, can drop it anywhere, will find itself, no need to configure, and that's what we're trying out right now. So it will do particulate and radiation. Uh, we chose particulate matter for the reason that most people know of it. Uh, the air contains so many pollutants that it's impossible to measure everything. So we decided to take air, you know, particulate matter as an indicator only of potential amount of pollution in an area. Of course, the particulate matter itself is not good for you, but we thought that it's kind of a good starting point. There is more, you can do, measure more things, and we experimented with it, but we said, you know, let's focus on one thing and get it right. And um, radiation, global wireless built-in, so wherever you are on the planet, you can put it down and it works. Uh, solar powered, super low power design, uh, both you know, from the hardware perspective but also from the software perspective, requires a tremendous amount of thinking how do you squeeze that battery and it is weatherproof. Um, this is the system, you can see it here, this is actually on the roof of the MIT Media Lab, we launched it in, in, uh, in April, the day after the EPA website got janked, very good timing. And uh, uh, so what's in the box, we're in Stanford, so I'm quite sure you guys will know what's in there. Uh, 
there's lots of stuff in there, but basically this low power electronics, these are two air sensors that kind of check each other because we air sensors are very finicky. They're not so reliable. So we decided to go with two air sensors. And this is our, our own unique design of a dual radiation sensor. One measures gamma, the other one is alpha, beta, and gamma and is exposed to the air. The other one is, is, is shielded from air. Um, that way we can uh, find uh, non-gamma uh, particulates in the air. And it's really important if you want to detect a nuclear disaster. Um, any guess where this is? This is very nearby. Uh, this is the solar cost in LA. And we decided to deploy most of the first batch of these devices in LA in a very close area. And the reason for that is we really want to understand what are the local dynamics of air pollution uh, as a, you know, what happens in neighborhoods? You know, is my street safe? What about your street? Is there a big difference or not? And what could it be? So this is a, the map as of uh, this morning. And you can see there's a bunch of systems here. And I can quickly see if I can show you live how that looks like. Um, Demo or die, here we go. Um, okay, so here's the same thing. Let me zoom in a little bit. So here you can see, you know, uh, the, the arrows kind of indicate if uh, the color of the arrow indicates the, the, the quality. So here and the direction is, if, you know, is going up or down. And you can kind of get an idea, you know, the red here is actually the, the air sensor and the green is the radiation. So you can kind of see that the air is not so good at the moment. And um, when I click on this sensor, we can kind of a massive pop-up here. But it kind of shows you what, you know, the, these are two air sensors measuring together. Uh, they're roughly in sync. Uh, as you can see, they're not perfectly in sync. And it's one of the challenges with sensors that uh, sensors are different manufacturers make different things. This is, you know, what is happening on the radiation over the last 30 days. You, oh, sorry, this is what happens over the last 30 days. This is what happening now, last 24 hours. And this is radiation there. No, no radiation issues, thankfully. But you get a good idea of the dynamics of air pollution. You know, radiation is, is something, thankfully, doesn't change a lot. But air quality is very dynamic, seasonal, throughout the day, et cetera. So and this is what we are, literally are today. We're now trying to get this data published. And we hope that we can get more volunteers to go and crank, crank, crack this data to see what, what is it really telling us and what does it really mean. So that is where we are on that. Um, OK, so I think with this, I would like to close my talk. And I think the most important thing about SafeCast is not to talk about things, but is to engage yourself into what matters to you. And this is really the passion about SafeCast, is engaging in the problem of environmental data. It is not to nag about it. It's not to say, oh, but the government is in that. This is really bottoms up. We as citizens can make a difference. And I think also that, you know, we have taken too much for granted with our governments, wherever you are. We, we kind of assume that data will be preserved by the government. We assume that it is trustworthy. Well, why don't we make sure that we check that? And if we extend that thought to things like fake news or any other information, you know, we need to build in more checks and balances. And that's the kind of, kind of the real kind of thing that I'm personally passionate about. And I think we should, all, you know, if, if there's anything I, I want you to to take home is, is that please do engage in your, in your communities and start with your community. Uh, don't start with what happens on the ice caps because they're melting anyways, but they're not going to stop melting because you worry about them melting. They will stop you worrying about what happens in your direct community because that's what you can influence. Don't talk about things you can't influence. So I think that is kind of the idea behind SafeCast. If you wonder where this is taken, uh, <laughs> And uh, this is me measuring radiation and getting serious attention from these gentlemen here. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, nothing happened after that. I was safe and whatever. But, you know, he was already, you know, talking to his boss and whatever. But, you know, do engage. Don't be shy. Uh, thank you very much. Thank okay. you so much. We have yes. about 15 minutes for uh, questions. Wonderful. If you want to identify yourself. Hi, thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Atsushi from Mesuto. I have a, one quick question about the data uh, and the relationship with data and time. I think time, you know, we want to know the, the data as recent as possible. We don't want to, 
you know, look at the data like a year ago or two years ago or something like that. Do you kind of update data? Uh, yes, and let me show you that. Um, uh, I think to your statement, there is, there is actually two sides to that. If you don't have a baseline, you don't know what the data means today. So yes, we do want to have the data of the past. So in the case of Fukushima, there were scientists that came to us and said, well, you know, that's all background radiation. How do you know that's from Fukushima? You know, power, you know, that's okay. You know, the mountains must be high there. Literally, I'm talking about serious experts now, okay? World-renowned expert uh, came to us like that. And we said, well, you know, you're right. You know, how do we know that? So it took us about two years to find the actual background radiation pre-Fukushima. It was available from the Japanese government, but it was so well kept that nobody could find it. So, <laughs> or, you know, we had a hard time finding it. Maybe it was us. But we found it. And it's actually, you know, if you go to our website, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how it works because it's much easier to show you than me talking about it. Let's go to Japan for a second. And you're absolutely right. What is important is to see how it changes. Because change is what we, we're, we're here for. We're not here for, you know, ah, yay, you know, great data. What do we do next? The important thing is, is to understand what happens. And uh, I can show you here this uh, AIST GSG natural background here. This map here is what it was before Fukushima Daiichi. Okay? This is the official government data. As you can see, very homogeneously dark blue. In Japan, there's almost no natural radiation sources, no uranium mines, no granite, nothing. It was the, it's the lowest radiation level in the world. Unfortunately, not anymore. So, and you can see that very clearly. So this is what it is today. But if you, I'm going to here use a function we call snapshots. These are uh, snapshots of the data in six months time slices. So this is data collected every six months. So you will see that it is kind of random, goes around because we don't measure every six months the same thing. It's really dependent on the thing. But if you look carefully, I'm just going to zoom in a little bit on the city here, Koryama. This is the largest city in Fukushima. And if you look carefully, uh, you will see that the, the, at that time, the radiation levels were about two microsieverts per hour. You, can also, you also will notice that it is pretty blotchy. This is 65 kilometers from the plant, by the way. Now I'm going to, this is six months after the disaster. This is 12 months. You see it becomes kind of purple. Purple is basically less... You know, it's going less. I can actually switch on this thing here. So I see it better. Um, yeah, I'm gonna. Yeah, so here in the city, you can see this is kind of when we. This is when we were working with the post office. They covered everything. As you see, slowly over time, you see it becomes kind of light blue, and you see some dark blue appearing. Dark blue is lower, and as we, as I go along, and we go to the last time slice, uh, you can see that it is almost dark blue, and dark blue is what it was six years ago. So in general, it's gone down 80%. So, and it's really important to have that context, and I, I fully agree with you. It's not, you don't want to have only data from the past. You also don't want to have data what is now. You want to have that context. Same thing with air pollution. You know, well, you know that's why it's, I was mentioning it's, very, it's a complex problem because it's a, it's a dynamic signal. So what, how do you figure out it's going up or down? Is it just normal? Or, you know, so there's lots of work to do there. But it's very important to get an idea of progress. For example, the fixed sensors you saw, they were installed on the request of people that were evacuated, and they wanted to see, is it really coming down? They were worried that there still were releases from the plant. We know today that it is you know, barely happening. The only leakage is into the ocean, thankfully, not into the air anymore. But how do you verify that? And the only way to verify this is to look over time how it changes. That's why we have fixed sensors that are 24 by 7, and then we drive around to keep baselining the place. And that's how it works. And yes, then the time slicing, is, is, the, is a very important aspect of, of making it happen. Lots of work, by the way, to visualize that and get it actually going. Thank you. Well, uh, I'm Rod Ewing. I'm on the faculty in Earth Sciences and a researcher uh, who, with Japanese colleagues, have been analyzing soils and, and all around Fukushima. And I want to uh, commend your, your effort uh, because um, I think, um, as a scientist and researcher and someone publishing in this area, I can say you can't rely on us for the information. And uh, the example I would cite, uh, making it a very short story, is we worked on soils and uh, uh, materials from around Fukushima, and 
that work is published. But then we had the chance to work on uh, air filters from Tokyo and uh, that were collected uh, during and after the, the, the tragedy. So the paper was written in the normal way, accepted by the journal, uh, but now is blocked by Japanese institutions and accusations. And it's, it's really been, I, I've been very impressed by how unresponsive institutions and journals yep. and uh, even some of my colleagues are to the, you know, or how, how effectively uh, simple information is blocked. And I think uh, in the absence of what you're doing, we would know very little about what actually happened uh, yeah. with Fukushima. And, 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 and I think it, what you're describing is a big dilemma for scientists in general. You know, even if you successfully get accepted, the, you know, I was mentioning our paper took a year to get it published. Uh, it's untimely. And the other problem is, is uh, we, we work with lots of scientists in the field. We always say, why don't you publish your raw data? Don't you think that is public domain? The environment should be not your data. If it is something, you know, there's research where it's proprietary, well, I understand that. But if you're measuring the environment, it should be first publish that and then work on it, but allow other scientists to work with you. And I think there is a, there is a good debate to be had as to, you know, not what is the best way to do it, but aren't there multiple ways to do science? And of course, you know, I was mentioning the Air Quality Act or whatever, it is difficult to make this right, but there are ways to do it. So for example, uh, there is a researcher, uh, Ken uh, Bissler from Woodhull Institute, actually here, around here, you, some of you may know of him. He got inspired by SafeCast because his problem was is that he measures the ocean. He's one of the authorities on measuring radiation in the ocean. And his problem was is that it is very hard for him to get the funds to collect all these water samples. So he needs a boat, and then he goes on the ocean, and he takes the water sample, then he boils out the water sample, and then you know, he measures the residue. It's, it, you know, it's something I almost volunteered for, and I said, Peter, you know, that's not my job. <laughs> said, this is not what we said. You know, because boiling a you know, pot of radioactive water, I said, maybe not. So, <laughs> But what he did is when he saw us working, and we met him about four or five years ago for the first time because we were following what he was doing, and we said, you know, we showed how we were working. He said, wow, this is a great idea. So what he did is, is he, made a, he made a kit. It's basically, it's, it's, it's kind of a plastic inflatable uh, tank. And if you want to measure your part of the ocean, you buy that from him for $50 or so. You pay for the cost. Then you fill it up with water. You send it to him. He will measure it. He will send you the results back. And he, of course, uses that for his research. And so, so I think these kind of ideas of how do you use, you, you use the communities to participate in this are great ways for researchers to rethink. And also I, I urge researchers to publish their raw data anyways, make it public domain. You know, the research is not collecting the data, the research is figuring out what's in there. And to kind of hold it like this actually handicaps you. And I think, in, in, I don't know what, what your paper is about or whatever, but you may be entirely wrong with your conclusions or whatever, it doesn't matter, other people can come in and verify and double check, you know, are these air filters okay or not? I have no idea. But I think that makes it interesting for scientists as well to start rethinking how can you do these type of projects. Now, if it is entirely, you know, in the lab and everything, that's fine. But these projects, you can't do in the lab. You have to go out. And it is very expensive and prohibitive to collect the data. And that's why we publish it. And we have lots of researchers that are benefiting from the data. I think that's the way to go. But yes, I understand your frustration. <laughs> yes. Yes. Scott Pump, I'm representing myself, and uh, just to, to follow up on that prior point, it took the Japanese government almost a month to recognize that they had melted down the core in three of those plants. Actually, they officially admitted it only this year. Okay, right, but it came out because of they, the they couldn't prove it. Well, that's right. So finally, well, we have, they could they have now it, taken the picture. But before that time, we had already flown over the country. Yeah, I know, and we had, I know, an, we I know. had all that information. No, but, you know, to be more to precise, us. they took pictures of it this year, and now. It's officially, yes, it has more, right. officially. <laughs> so any of those, those challenges notwithstanding, yes. there's a lot of wonderful things about Japanese culture. Getting two plus two equals four out of them is frequently difficult. Um, what I'm interested in is the response time after the original hydrogen explosions to having the first operating equipment available for people to use and, and go out and, and okay. monitor. And in my background, I was the first responder there 
working for Westinghouse at the time, we were flying unmanned drones over the reactor buildings, taking radiological right. and visual surveillance. So we were out there at the same time. <laughs> yeah, when we started, we started on the day after the earthquake, but we had our initial plan was not to do what you see right now. Our initial plan was to collect available data and just aggregate it and make it available to the public because that was, we thought that was the problem. We thought it is there, but it's just hard to find and specifically for people outside of Japan, it was all in Japanese, and people in Japan didn't know what it was. So that was our first thing. So we built a website in the first week, and the website uh, was basically a Google map with data on it. But after a week, we had no data on it. Yeah, we had some data, it was nothing, so not usable. So that was one problem. So then the next week, we made a forum on the website where people could upload their, their data, and we did a Kickstarter campaign uh, to collect money to buy Gaga counters that we would distribute to people. But the problem was Geiger counters sold out and the lead time went from six months to 12 months because the sensor supply is very, very limited. And the factories that make them can't ramp, ramp up their production line. So, so we did that just to find out that we could do that. So that, was, that brought us kind of three, four weeks into our project. And then we all got together. At that time, we had a big group of people, the pool. They came together and then we came up with the idea with a few Geiger counters, what do we do? And we said, why don't we drive around? Then we did a trial to see if it was doable that was done while we were already thinking how to build it. It was validated. And then we built the first system in a week's time. So we started that in mid-April. And we had it ready a week later, April 22nd. Uh, it was ready. We drove around the Imperial Palace to test it. It worked. And the next morning, uh, together with three more people, we drove to uh, Fukushima and we started to use it. That was the first device in action. Once it was in action, we saw, wow, you know, this is really working. We also saw that the radiation was very was really blotchy, so we knew that you know you had to go street by street, because you could walk from one side of the street to the other side of the street and have a very different uh, story. So we knew, oh wow, we need to do this bigger. Then it took us a month to you know it took us another week to get three, and then it took us a month to make a version of the system that the first version had a PC on a USB cable, it was, and it crashed all the time. So we, you needed a second person to reboot, reboot, <laughs> reboot, but it worked, right? But the next version was contained like this using an Arduino and was self-contained. And that was a month after that in, in May, uh, during Golden Week, which is around May 5 or 6, we had the first of those. And that's what you saw in that little car. And, that, and then after that, we built hundreds of those in the months after that. And now we have uh, thousands of these. Okay, so if we think of this in, from the perspective of responding to an event like the right. hurricanes in the south right now, we just can remove that month of dead time Immediately and measure. That's a couple of pieces. So practically speaking, maybe two to three weeks, if not quicker, yeah. depending upon what you're interested in. Like right. No, we, we have a big Pelican case with, with these things filled, and we can airlift that any time to any place, and people can start using it right away. Some of, you know, today we have Bluetooth and other ways to upload the data faster. First version, you know, was yeah, basically right. SD card. There was no Bluetooth 4.0 six years ago. So. But yeah, so we can do it much faster. We actually talk about it. How fast can we respond? And because we have lots of volunteers all around the world, if so, you know, as Ms. mentioned, the beach. You know, at that time, within 24 hours, we had somebody with, a, with our system on the beach uh, verifying the data. So yes, we can do it much faster. But uh, for example, if you look at south of Florida, if that happens there, the real problem is, is accessibility. So you know, we were talking about how can we get this on a boat you know, or a little boat? How do you drive it? You know, because of the floods, right? So how, do you, how would you handle that type of situation? That's new. Uh, you know, uh, and I think also the real problem also is with citizen science is that uh, it relies on people taking the initiative to do it, but not all of it is safe. You know, so we, we don't really know as to what level do you want to be citizen science, what level do you want to say, no, I'm not in, you know, that's, that's really not uh, the level to go into. So, uh, right, you know, the, the reality in Fukushima was is that all those people that measured there were not evacuated and living there, so they wanted to know what was happening. But, you know, they're, they're, Sometimes there, you know, uh, there is kind of a bounty hunter mentality where people want to go find hot spots and stuff like that, and that's not really how it works. So we don't, you know, we, we don't encourage people to go, to go and do that. We really want people to measure randomly. But yes, the response time at that time was, uh, let's say, six weeks. But it involved building the whole thing and making all the mistakes. And in retrospect, you know, the real question is why didn't the system exist before that? And that's really the interesting thing. It didn't exist. Nobody had built it. All that was available was either. Uh, very expensive and designed for a different purpose, or simply not there. You know, Daiichi had no Geiger counters. They just had none. They were, you know, they were dead jealous at, with, with our Geiger counters. So, yeah, you brought your own, right? Yeah, from the States, right? So actually, US Army had many. 
was you know nuclear attack and it's well prepared, but uh, in Japan uh, it was uh, not available. Very very weird. But that's reality. Yes. I, I'm Walter Ma from Slack, so I'm not sure we can measure the radiation there. Uh, my question is: It's a very nice uh, citizen science project. What is your business model? How do you sustain your activity financially? Okay. First of all, we're not a business, so no business model. <laughs> that was easy. You mentioned you're from Slack? Pardon? You, you mentioned your company is Slack? Yeah, S-L-A-C. S-L-A-C, okay, not C-K. Okay, no, no, because we use Slack, but okay. Oh, but, yes, okay. Slack is different. It's like, okay. No, it's just curious. Yeah. No, so, so the, uh, maybe, but, uh, uh, you know, tongue in cheek, we do have a model to sustain, and that model to sustain we're still discovering. But we know that we have gone for six years. We know that it's fairly exceptional. And I think it has a lot to do with uh, focusing on what the community is pulling. So it's not that we have a grand roadmap of what we're going to do next. We know that the community needed radiation measurement. We know that communities are, are want to measure their air. And as a group of volunteers, because we're part of the community, we're all teaming up to go and do that. That is kind of the, the one part of the sustainability. The way we, we finance ourselves is par primarily from donations. Uh, we uh, have been lucky to have various you know, uh, uh, organizations and people that have uh, helped us financially. But it's also financed, you know, I call it self-finance by all the volunteers that build their own equipment. That equipment we don't have to get money for. People basically run it on their own. So we see our, uh, you know, we see the project function as the facilitator and kickoff, kind of kickstarter of the next round. And then the goal is, is to get that to a level where people can self-finance that. Or maybe there's, people will step in to help people finance that uh, at that point in time. And I think that is kind of a going back and forth. But the real driver behind it is people's own selfish interest to figure out what's happening in their neighborhood. I think that's kind of the, the, the driver. If you don't play into that, you say, no, I'm going to measure something where nobody's interested in global warming or radiation or whatever, you're wasting your time. You're just doing busy work. So it has to be something that has a pool. And I think that's the business model. And how we finance ourselves is donations, but we hope to, you know, increasingly we're trying to figure out, of course, how do we be less dependent on donations and how to sustain that. But we don't want to become a company uh, for that matter. We want to uh, run as a nonprofit organization. Uh, as much as we can. And one thing we do is, is our, our designs are public domain. So people can, uh, actually not public domain, our designs are open. Uh, companies and other people can build these devices or produce them. And uh, so that gives us an opportunity to get some, you know, kind of donations back from people that do that. And that's how we work as well. So, but we're still developing this as we're going. Uh, for, for example, if you look at Japan, you know, Jap Japan and measurements mostly, you know, lots of work already has been done. But it, we found out that by making it available outside of Japan, we, we were kind of overwhelmed. How many people want to measure radiation, even though there's no disaster? And we know for air, there is a, a latent need to do, uh, to do that as well. But there's not much happening in the space of outside air measurement. Most of it is indoors. So, and why? I don't know, but this happens. So out, if you, you can buy outdoor stations that are very expensive, but they don't work for citizens. So we're trying to figure out how to, how to get there one way or the other. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.